Welcome to another episode of The Genius Podcast. My name is Karen Doyle, your host and founder of The Genius Project, an initiative for Catholic women designed to support and resource them towards growth in all areas of life, spiritual, personal and professional. We seek to do this through the Catholic Women's Masterclass, our Catholic coaching programs for women, our online courses and resources and our Catholic Women's Summits and our virtual Catholic Women's Summit, which we have one coming up in just a few months. So ladies, next week, I'll be letting you know the dates for the Catholic Women's Summit. So you can mark those on your calendar and look forward to some of the beautiful women that we're going to bring you to really enrich and encourage you in your faith journey. So over the last few weeks, we have been exploring this theme of restoration and how the Lord wants to do a work of restoration deep within our soul. On today's podcast, I'm joined by Joy Adan. As we've mentioned on the previous few podcasts, if you would like to go deeper with this work of restoration in your own life, I'd love for you to join us inside the Catholic Women's Masterclass. This is a four month journey of restoration and renewal where we walk alongside you fortnightly for four months as you learn to establish rhythms of renewal that will see you flourishing in life. If you'd like to find out more about this or our Catholic coaching one-on-one programs for women, please visit the website www.geniusproject.co or you can send me an email karen at geniusproject.co and I'd be very happy to answer any questions you may have. On this week's episode of the Genius Podcast, I'm joined by Joy Adan. Joy lives in Sydney, Australia. She's a freelance writer and creative and she is passionate about encouraging people to learn to tell their stories. She describes herself as a maker, a creative and a storyteller. And one of her great passions is to blog and to tell stories through the written word. In our conversation, Joy shares her experience of hitting rock bottom and the steps that she took to move herself from that place. She talks about the role that creativity played in helping bring about this restoration to her soul and how we need connection with other women in this journey of life. This is very much a smorgasbord conversation where we roam across a number of topics from Joy's personal journey and her story. And I know that you're just going to be blessed by our conversation. Can I also encourage you that if you're struggling with this area of surrender, of trust, and of really handing over those areas in your life that you're struggling with, I'd love to offer you a free copy of our Surrender Novena. This is such a beautiful prayer. And if you'd like a copy, I will leave the link in the show notes for you. I have found this Surrender Novena to be so helpful in those moments where you just hit the end of yourself, where you say, God, I just can't anymore. I need you to come and I need you to help me. So if you'd like a copy, there will be a link in the show notes and on our Instagram page, genius underscore project underscore daily. Ladies, I hope you enjoy this conversation with Joy Adam. Joy, welcome to the Genius Podcast. It's such a joy and a gift to have you with us today. I can connected with you recently over Instagram and I'm looking forward to getting to know you better. You're in Australia as well and there's a lot of, I guess, points of connection and I guess this sense of kindred spirit um, in terms yeah. of, I guess, creativity and love for the church and faith and so I just want to say a huge welcome to the podcast today. Oh, thank you for having me. I've been listening intently for months now and it's just been amazing to to follow your journey and to follow the journey of the women who you've had on. So it's been, it's a great honour to, to be a guest. Oh, well, thank you. We've just had like 40 minutes chatting before the podcast and I'm like, it's a great gift for me. It's lovely to connect with you and I'm really looking forward to this conversation. There's so many, I think it's going to be a bit of a smorgasbord conversation. We're going to yep. go across a few topics, but Joy, you really have a lot of wisdom and a lot of goodness to offer women. And so this is going to be a great conversation. But I wondered if you'd just kick off by sharing a little bit about yourself, um, your background, uh, what you're doing at the moment with us and our listeners. Sure. So 
My name is Joy Adan. I have grown up in and still live in Western Sydney in Australia. So I'm out Blacktown Way for anyone who is out, out in Western Sydney. And um, I have two young boys. I have a nine-year-old and a five-year-old. I've been married for 11 years. And by, by trade or by, um, I guess, study, I've been a writer. I've been working in communications. I've dabbled a bit in corporate communications, in business journalism, um, opinion writing, and memoir. And, um, and by night when the kids are usually in bed uh, or while we're watching Netflix or so, you know, watching some movie, and um, I'm usually lettering and doing calligraphy and a lot of visual art, which is something I've been doing for the past, uh, I'd say, five years since my second son was born. Okay, is that when you started, is it? Well, I've always loved writing and I've always loved visual communication um, and I guess that's what got me into multimedia production and, and marketing to begin with but lettering specifically in calligraphy was something I picked up when um when my son was a newborn and I was actually going through therapy at the time and one of the things that my counsellor suggested I do was to take five minutes every day to create something that was specifically for me so she's like, you know, if you love cooking, you can cook something, but don't cook it as a function of feeding your family. <laughs> like, cook something that, you know, learn how to cook something that you want to learn how to cook. Or if, you know, if you want to make something, make something that's just going to bring you joy and doesn't necessarily have to be given to anybody else. And so at the time I said, you know, I've always loved, my sisters can do beautiful calligraphy, like very um, beautiful, traditional copper plate calligraphy. And I always envied them for it. So I was like, oh, I want to try learning this. And so I picked up um, a paintbrush and started doing brush calligraphy and you just haven't started. stopped <laughs> you just taught yourself literally oh, I did a, I, I watched a lot of online okay. courses and videos yeah, and it's not something self-taught. that you'd done growing up it was no this was your new passion your new yeah passion. fantastic yeah. and it came about like I know we were chatting about this before the podcast but you went through a season where you did experience postnatal depression and mm. This was linked to that. Is that correct? Yeah. Out of that experience. Are you able to just share a little bit around what that was like for you and and I guess what triggered that? I guess motherhood is such a big transition in life. I know we had uh, Sister Rachel from the MGLs talking about transitions in life episodes ago. And that motherhood's a huge transition. You go from being this person Mm. who has a life and, you know, you might be working corporate and doing all these things to being at home and let alone the body, the hormonal changes, and that can Mm. create a lot of havoc for women, can't it? It can. And I found my, I guess what makes my experience a bit unique is that I experienced it after the birth of my second son. So after the birth of my first, which was a massive change in my marriage, massive change in my own identity. Um, where my, my eldest went through a few hospital visits as a newborn. And so that was quite, I remember that being quite stressful, but I, I had managed to manage and cope okay. And, but when the, my second was born um, four years later, I remembered um, a distinct moment where I knew something was wrong. And we had, it was a, just a typical morning. We dropped off my son to kindergarten. And so it was one of those nice uneventful mornings, the ones that go smoothly where you're like, oh, that was unusually <laughs> good. <laughs> said, good. Oh, okay. Well, thank you. That's that. Thank you, God. I remember we were driving down the Great Western Highway. I was on um, heading west and we were approaching um, the intersection where it hits the M4. And uh, no, the, the radio was off it was quiet in the car and I just started crying mm. and I remember like the tears just started to come and I thought okay why am, why am I crying like nothing had happened. happened that day and um and I was like okay maybe I'm just hormonal you know I've got a newborn in the back seat of the car maybe it's just hormones so I kind of just let myself cry and then the crying just turned into sobbing And I just couldn't stop. And then I remember we were, we kept driving, got to where we needed to, I can't even remember what the appointment was that we were going to, got to where we needed to go. I carried on the, at the, um, the day, but then at the end of the day, I remember sitting down with my husband going, weirdest thing happened today. And I don't know, I don't know what it is. And he goes, I like, is there something that's bothering you? And I couldn't put my finger on it. And I was just like, I don't know, but I just feel really heavy, like something something's up like something just didn't feel something felt off Mm. and a couple of those episodes happened where I would be having a completely normal day 
but there was a, almost like a weight that was just following me around. And eventually um, when I, I, and I continued to talk openly with my husband about it because I knew there was something that wasn't quite right. And then he said, do you want to go speak to a doctor about it? And I said, I think so. I think I need to because something's up. And I was sitting in the GP's office and I remember just telling him everything that was going on, you know, new, I've got a, I've got a little one who just started kindergarten. He, he struggled to start kindergarten. Like he was really um, attached. And I, and I remember for the first term when he would go off into class, I would have to rip his hand out of mine oh. and then he would leave crying. And then I'd go into the car and I'd sit somewhere and I'd have my cry. Yes. <laughs> so we were going through that transition. Yes. And then we were going through, you know, introducing my newborn to like life and taking care of a newborn and we were also in the middle of trying to build a house at the same time and um and we were living with my in-laws and so all of these things when I explained like, the life situation yeah it was and you know I think like most women I were just like well this is just life so you know so you just you just carry on but when I explained all of those things to the GP he was like well no wonder you're tired like you're going that's a, that's a lot and I'm like is it though and he goes have you had rest and I'm like was do, that do parents, <laughs> I kind of parents like, rest anymore do newborns like do parents and newborn are we allowed that <laughs> like I just kind of thought we came with the territory and um and he kind of you know he talked me through this idea like this to me it was almost like a foreign idea where he's like you know you're allowed like you if you feel overwhelmed whether it's physically or emotionally you have to like you have to for the sake of your own survival because this isn't sustainable like you have to stop and rest and um and that's a lesson that I've had to learn and relearn so much over the past six years like even though you know that was a aha moment for me and I and I did end up like he put me in a healthcare plan I did end up seeing um a psychologist um, for a number of sessions to talk through all of the reasons why I found it so difficult to rest like why it was so difficult for me to like just you know put my phone down stop looking at emails stop like starting a new project stop saying yes to this event like I just I had to work through all of these reasons why I felt like I had to just keep going 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 all the time but I'm so so grateful that I I had somebody that I could unpack all of that with and and in a way I'm grateful that I I got to that point where God was like you know what no you need somebody to help you through this because if I hadn't I think I would still be struggling Yes. And I think those struggles actually magnify as we get older with the additional children and pressures of life. Mm. So whether or not you give it time and the attention that it needs when it's sort of flagging it to you or whether you push it aside because a lot of people it's too hard to deal with because it's, Mm. it's sometimes not the situation as it is the mindsets and the backstory and the family of origin and the wounds that we carry. So there's Mm. a lot of that soul work that has to be done, isn't there? Yeah. And it takes time and you can't do that while you're on that freight train of life. Oh yeah. You have like, if you, if you're trying to do soul work while you're operating <laughs> at 120 Ks an hour, like it's not effective. No, <laughs> you do, you'll effective. crash and burn. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You really will. And it's so right. Like that is so such the right term for it because it does take a lot of um, really committing to increasing self-awareness and looking deep into your heart about what it is that you value, why it is that you value those things. Are those things the things that you want to keep placing value on? Like I had to do a lot of, a lot of sitting down, a lot of unpacking past events, a lot of, a lot of um, understanding the voices in like the tapes that were running through my mind about, you know, like the default uh, response that I would have to certain situations. And it was hard work and all, and it was painful work. But it was it was really good. And I think one of the best um, analogies that uh, I had a, a coach tell me was if you if you have that bubbling feeling that something's not quite right and you don't deal with it and you keep trying to suppress it, it's like trying to hold a ball underwater mm. and you waste a lot of energy <laughs> holding that ball down. But eventually it's going to come back up <laughs> like that pressure is going to build up. So you may as well do it. Yeah. I know I have learned that the hard way myself but uh, it's far you're far better off doing that I remember many years ago I went through gosh a bit of burnout it's probably about 10 or more years ago and not giving it the time like exactly what you're talking about keeping trying to keep going but then realizing that 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 just was begging and screaming for attention and looking back, it's just, it's actually a really beautiful time. There's that beautiful scripture in Hosea where it says, I will lead her into the desert and there I'll speak tenderly to her. 
And Mm -hmm. I think those desert moments of our lives, the ones that we're actually scared of, the ones that we fight (laughs) to acknowledge or to go into are actually the most sacred and they're the seasons in which God does his most powerful work of restoration. And I know you were sharing, you know, you you worked through that with a psychologist and in prayer as well. What are some Mm. of the big takeaways, maybe some, I guess, of those lessons that you think might be helpful for women? I think you you shared around family of origin. That was a big one. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's something that I remember when um when I was doing marriage preparation, one of the things that have that struck both my husband and I that have stayed with us, that have stayed with us and really, I guess, um, coloured our marriage in many ways is family of origin and the idea that you never just marry the person, but you marry the whole family and all of the values and all of the history that that family brings. And I remember sitting in a in a session with with my psychologist and um, and I'd been praying about it for a long time too. And one of the things that was became really apparent in that session was I'd grown up in a in a household that really valued like the, our ethic was hard work hard work and productivity and you know those are values that I mean I I am so grateful for because you know I I, we, I grew up in a really studious family and my parents um, taught us such really valuable skills like life skills but at the cost of play and and valuing play and I remember um, sitting there thinking you know one of the or realizing that one of the most shameful things that I could I felt that I could ever like anyone in our family could ever be called was lazy because we my my mom was like no you can't be lazy like if there's if there's time in the day put it to good use put it to good work and so I really I was it was almost like I had my my body my body was screaming for rest and my body was saying please let give me time for restoration but my mind and even just that my heart was like, no, 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 keep like, take care of your family, go, go work hard, take care of your family. Like, that's what you need to do. And one of the biggest blessings and learnings that came out of that season of my life was really relishing and learning to appreciate and step into the gift of rest Mm -hmm. and owning and learning and really wrapping my head and my heart around the fact that you know god gave us the sabbath and we need to embrace the sabbath and also he he created in us a uh, the ability to rest and recreate and i think i had to relearn that idea of what recreation was yes um that was something that i sat down with with my therapist and really had to work through because she's like do you give yourself time to play do you give yourself time to just You're like what's relax? that <laughs> And I'm like, who does that? And I'm like, I play with my kids, but that's not really playing. Like, that's, <laughs> to me, that's not that fun. Like, that's. Not... And she's like, no, no, you've actually got to give yourself time for play that you like. Play that's for you. That's like, and that's and that's why she she said, you know, if you love lettering and you want to get creative and you want to use your gifts to be visual and to to craft and to make things, then do that, and you're allowed to do that. And I've realized, especially um, so many times over the past, especially even the last 18 months, we've gone in and out of lockdown and work's gotten busy and there's seasons that have, you know, there are peaks and troughs for for work. I Every time when I feel like I'm about on the verge of burnout or when things in life are starting to feel really chaotic, I can pinpoint to, to the point where, okay, I've forgotten to give myself time for rest and recreation. And as soon as I put it back in, as soon as I give myself permission for a little bit of time to paint or to letter or to make something, then life becomes more manageable. Life doesn't get less busy. Like those things don't go away, but I I feel like I can do it. You're different in the middle of it. Yeah. It's such an important lesson to learn. I mean, I've had a personally like this year has been crazy with lockdown Mm. work. So I feel like I am needing to return to that place and, and have been trying to weave that in. I know in my sisterhood group a couple of weeks ago, a couple of friends were like, well, just 30 minutes in a day. And, you know, sometimes you're like, well, I just can't, I just don't even have, like I I have my prayer time, but that's different to this time where it is. You just settle. And I think like I have been doing that over the past month, which has been really good because it's like you come home to yourself. And so Mm. then you're able to engage with whatever's going on around you from a different, with a different posture and from a different position where the circumstances aren't different, but you're different in those circumstances. And 
Mm. I think that whole idea of recreation, it's really, if you break down that word recreation to recreate, create, we yep. need to be recreated within ourselves. Like we are a unity of body and soul. So we're not just these machines that have to produce and work and, mm. and churn things out, but we are, we have this soul and this interior life that really like that's where the Lord abides in the quietness yes. and the stillness of our hearts. And so there is a great invitation there to, um, to recreate. I know in our Catholic women's masterclass we're doing, we look, we spend one module really looking at the role of play and recreation mm. because it is absolutely central to this idea of restoration and the Lord wanting to restore us. So it's- absolutely. And, and we're built for it. Like we, that creative spirit it's we're, it's in us it's built in us and we and obviously biologically we know we can do it but we also need to do it within our everyday life as well like it and I mean I, I remember um five years ago I was listening to Brene Brown and the power of vulnerability and one of the things she was saying um that really struck me and I say it to a lot of um people especially when I do creative corporate workshops because like a lot of people are like create creative I'm not creative like I'm not artistic I'm like that's actually not what what we mean by creative like but we have a creative spirit in us that is built to make something but that's that energy that creative energy it's not benign and if we don't use it it metastasizes and it, it manifests in other ways it manifests in anger it manifests in rage it manifests in depression it manifests in other ways and so if we don't channel it in the right place and sometimes it's art but sometimes it's it's music sometimes it's cooking sometimes it's gardening sometimes it's fixing a car whatever it is where our bodies are attuned to to bringing something back into the world and bringing something new into the world. That's where we're called to create. It doesn't have to be artistic creativity. I totally agree with you because, you know, so many people say I'm not creative and leave it at that. So therefore, Mm. but the point is we actually have a mandate to create Mm. by God. We are called to be co-creators with him. Yes. So, Like you said, you acknowledge the biological creation, but really we're called to bring something to life while we're here, we're called to make manifest yeah. and to give glory to him through what we do with our gifts and our talents. And those gifts and talents are different for everybody. Mm-hmm. And the task yeah. of all of us is to really walk this journey of discovering and asking the Lord to reveal what our gifts are, our unique gifts, our unique personal vocation, and then how we respond to that. And we offer that back to others and to the Lord. And there's something, I think that is the place where people come alive. Mm, interesting that your therapist sort of directed you to that place of creativity in terms of I guess restoring you and bringing you back to life it's just mm. so important now interestingly you were sharing you've just recently resigned from your work yes <laughs> which is a huge step but yep. why, why did you do that I, I love and the point that I'm really wanting to get to here is just giving women permission because so often we spend our life in these boxes. We have these expectations, whether they come from family of origin or spouses or ourselves, we place a lot of expectation on ourselves. But you've kind of just thrown those off in a responsible way, I might add. <laughs> I don't want to irresponsibly throw off expectations because they're not all bad. But I'm interested in you just sharing a little bit around your reason for that. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned that you touched on it earlier. Like it's been a it's been a crazy 18 months, mm. right? And I think one of the greatest blessings that have has come out of the last 18 months for me personally has been the ability to slow down and just focus on family. Um, some of those, some of that has come out of necessity, <laughs> and some of it has come out of of tragedy and grief and you know, there have been events in the last probably two and a half years or so that I think have probably been leading up to me wanting to take a step back and to reassess where it is that I spend my time and be, to be quite intentional about that. And I think what happened over, the, especially this year, um, you know, I got an opportunity to, again, spend some time at home, working from home with my husband, with the two kids. And as soon as I, I got this sense of, oh, okay, we're reopening and I think everything's going to get as busy as it was a year or two ago, there was a part of me that's like, do you want it to be as busy as it was a year or two ago? And there, there was a resounding in my head. I was like, no, I don't. I really don't. I actually want to be more intentional with my time and my talent. And I sat down with my husband over a number of um 
like just dinners <laughs> and you know late night conversations after the kids were in bed and it's like well what you know what do you want and is it the job itself that was making you restless and I'm like no I don't think it was I think it's the kind of situation that we're in at the moment and we kind of we sat down and had a really deep conversation about what it is both of us want over the next couple of years and we I remember doing a very similar thing five or six years ago where it was like okay like life has changed actually things have been thrown into the mix now and and you know the direction where we thought we were going might not actually be the right direction for us anymore and I think that's a healthy thing for every person to do right. whether they're in a relationship or not actually to just re reassess yeah reevaluate. and um and yeah I I realized I I don't want the rat race I don't need the rat race some people love the rat race I don't actually know that many people who do yeah. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I, I was like, you know what, no, if I can, if I have the opportunity um, physically, financially, mentally, spiritually to, to slow down, I'm going to take it um, because when else in my life do I get a chance to do this? And we did really, I really prayed about it um, and I'm actually just using this season to discern and to figure out, okay, God, where are you calling me next? Where do you want me to use my gifts? Where do you want me to use my time? Where do you want me to focus my energy and it's terrifying, can I just say. I think the first month after resigning was like, okay, easing back into normal life out, outside lockdown. But the thing that struck me a couple of weeks ago was this idea that, oh, my entire life had just been structured around work and needing to be around for other people. Like, and And I had to reacquaint myself with this feeling of, no, 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 you don't have to do any of that. You own your day. And if you and if all you did today was rest, that's actually what you needed. Like that's okay. <laughs> that's perfectly okay. And like listen to your body, listen to your heart and what your soul actually wants. And it's been difficult to relearn that and to relearn the pace that I want to operate at. But I think one thing that I've loved is that I can spend time with my children, but I can also go to mass. I can sit down in prayer and I, and I can just focus on the things that I know are going to be restorative to my heart and, and re-energize me for whatever the next step might be. Absolutely. I love that. And it just, I love your courage to take that step because it's scary. It is. <laughs> I mean, it's, you're laughing about it. <laughs> I've been there and I know what that's like. I remember many years ago I was writing The Genius Project. It's this course on the feminine mm. genius. Now, we filmed it while I, and I was just newly pregnant with our third child and I threw up like for nine months. It was seriously oh, no. horrific. Horrific. It was like we couldn't have kids for six years and God's like, here you go. Yeah, <laughs> and, and here's like, something else to go with it. Oh, no. <laughs> And then none of them slept for a year, like, oh, golly. But um, praise God. But anyway, I was remember filming and feeling really sick and then trying to get the project happening and there just wasn't flow to it. And I really felt like similar to you, that sense of shelving it for a while. But then, you know, you're old, the ways that you think, I think our mind. Oh, it's like it's ingrained. It's like there's a there's a voice in your head that's like, what are you doing? What are you yes. doing? Are you doing yes. that? Are you it's like is that, are out. you being productive? Are you- <laughs> that's right. Are you being productive? Are you working hard? Like, don't be lazy. Mm-hmm. And it was a very I remember at the moment, just and I can even remember standing where I was standing on our balcony, just making that decision. And it was so hard, but I never regretted it. Like I shelved it, I think, for four years actually. So it wasn't just mm-hmm. a little time. And I fully gave myself to being a mum at home with our three kids, because we had three kids in three years. And mm. when I did come back to it, oh my gosh, it's like Jonathan took the kids every Saturday morning for about a month and it just flowed out of me. Yeah. So the Holy Spirit. So I think I'd bring that up because I think so often if we I see it in a, the lives of a lot of women, I know I've ex- encountered it too, but we sense that the Lord is calling us to make a bold and a courageous decision, but we're really scared. And it's that fear of missing out, yes, but it's scared of getting the decision wrong. Mm. And I, I do think part of discernment is this active discernment that often we actually just have to take the step. And if it is the wrong choice, God will show us pretty quickly. Yes. But if yes. things are tugging on your heart, if the Holy Spirit, and I do believe that the Holy Spirit moves in those inspirations of the heart, and when we can slow down long enough to acknowledge them and listen to them and then act on them, his grace just comes down in those moments. And so 
I just want to say to women that if they do have those tugs of the Holy Spirit, whether it's to get up off the couch and, and get moving and to take up some activities because you've been too lethargic or complacent or whether you've been too busy and you need a bit of that stillness, is just to give yourself the permission and to really listen to the promptings of the Holy Spirit in your life because you never, you know, my experience is you never actually regret that. What seems mm. really scary actually becomes some of the greatest seasons of your life. Yeah, oh, yes. And, and you know, I, as soon as I'd made the decision, this overwhelming peace uh, there you go. just settled <laughs> over me, even though I was still terrified because, you know, there's so much, uh, like you know there's so much in the unknown and I'm and I don't know about you Karen but I I like control are, are you an eldest child by any chance no I'm the youngest are you yeah, yeah so, it's very much well you know we don't yeah, it's very much an eldest child office. thing to be yeah. the responsible one and to yeah. know and you know and and def and definitely my elder sister is 100 percent that yeah. I think we're kindred spirits though yeah. we're used to just kind of as you know control the controllables and and, you know, take out as much uncertainty as possible. And that is, you know, it's steady advice. And I think in a lot of things in life, that's absolutely true. And, and that's absolutely good. But I also think there is an, like faith and reason need to coexist. And, and there needs to be an element of, of absolute trust. And I think the one thing that I realized as I was discerning was there's never been a time in my life where God has not taken care of me. There are so many things in my life that I could just never have predicted. There are so many things that I just never thought that I could get through that I, there have been so many moments where I've thought, how on earth am I supposed to deal with this right now? But somehow God's Holy Spirit just does his thing. And then I'm at the other side of it and I look back and I'm like, okay, I, okay, well, there you, there you go. God's taking care of me. And I just, I knew that that was a moment where I had to say, okay, God, I'm your daughter. I know, I know you love me. I know there's nothing else I actually need to do in my life right now except to be loved by you. So if I can just trust in that love, then I'm going to be okay. And I think that's, that's, I think there's an element of, and we were talking about family of origin where I had felt like I had to earn that love that I needed to prove that, you know, I was being the best mother that I could be, that I could be, you know, that I was as active in my community as possible or be the most supportive friend that I could be or be the best daughter and that I could be. And all of those things are good. But if I stopped doing all of those things, God would still love me and God would still take care of me. And that was the thing, like, that's the thing that I think we forget. It's like, you don't earn any of it. He yeah. loves you regardless, exactly where you are. So allow him to love you. Absolutely. Can I, I it's such an important one, this whole area of identity. And like you're touching on here, we find our identity, we construct our identity, we're taught to construct our identity. Mm -hmm. But our freedom comes when we actually get a revelation at a profound level of our identity as the beloved child of God. Mm -hmm. Did you, was there a big moment for you where you got that or was that a gradual awakening? There are definitely distinct moments where I thought, where my heart just, it was almost like it'd just been broken into pieces. But then in that moment of brokenness, God was like, I'm here. <laughs> and I, re I remember actually one of them was World Youth Day in 2005. I had pilgrimaged um, through the pathways of St. Paul, so through all um, the places in Greece where he had visited and, and it, was, it was such an incredible experience. But I remember distinctly starting that pilgrimage and the prayer in my heart was a bit of a sassy one. I was saying to God, you know what, for years you've, I've heard everyone say, you know, God loves you. That's nice. Yes. <laughs> Can you prove it. I was like, I was a bit like, come on, God, prove it. Prove that it, is prove sassy. it, prove it. What did he do? And, <laughs> and, and like everywhere he took me on that pilgrimage, I like he revealed something like he was like, you dare me to love you watch this and uh, my heart was just blown away like just by the the history of our church I think there was something that really tugged at my heart when I realized how far back 
our our history and our family and our holy family goes like there was a like okay this is don't test god mate because he's a he's a god of everything so he's got got the runs on the board (laughs) yeah exactly it's like oh you want proof here's proof and and like i just remember just being floored by so many of the things that i i saw but then there was one moment in particular um actually i think i might have the scripture but i i was um the theme for that World Youth Day was the three wise men. Um, and I remember um, sitting in the, I think it was the final mass. It must have been the final mass at Marinfeld. And the then Pope Benedict um, was, you know, doing his kind of big call to action for everybody that was there. And the words that he said, I was sitting in a field of a million people and I just, I, he was talking to me. Like he, the things he said, it was like, Straight I felt you. like my heart had just been broken up into pieces and every word was penetrating that heart and saying, and, and the call really, like he, he says like, you know, people say this cannot be what life is about and it's not. And so help people to discover the true star, which points out the way to us, Jesus Christ. Let us seek to know him better and better so as to be able to guide others to him with conviction. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, it must be seen, but this must be evident in our lives. It must be seen in our capacity to forgive. It must be seen in our sensitivity to others. It must be seen in our willingness to share. It must be seen in our commitment to our neighbour, both those close at hand and those physically far away. Let the others see this. Let the world see this. This is exactly the witness that the world expects from the disciples of Jesus Christ in this way and through your love above all, the world will be able to discover the star that we follow as believers. Let us go forward with Christ and let us live our lives as true worshippers of God. Mm. And I sat there and I was just like, okay, yes, you love me. I'm sorry. I, I, I'm sorry. Even like, it was just like this immense call. And every single time I've ever, I've ever been asked to speak at something or share my testimony I come back to that calling to you from that world youth day as a reminder it's like the world will know who we believe by how we love because that is the God that we believe in and that is that that is my identity I am a beloved daughter of God and if I live my life as that then everything else will fall into place yeah that's so beautiful I love how profound and definitive that was for you Mm. I think, you know, the Lord often has us on this very gentle journey, but sometimes he just breaks through, doesn't he? And he does. it's like, <laughs> here you are. <laughs> and he's done it so many times since. Like, I mean, that was, that was, oh God, so a long time ago. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, as, as I journey towards marriage, even in my first year of marriage, um, and I've shared this in, in other talks in the past, you know, that's, a, that again, we were talking about periods of transition. Like that's another change when you enter into motherhood again another change and all these seasons in life you know we have to fight to rediscover and and recommit but god will again he will restore us he'll reclaim us and he reminds us like you know you're through all of this through all the changes i've got you you're okay Absolutely. And I think this is a beautiful message joy just to share and kind of to end with is just this message that God holds us in the palm of his hand and because because the reality is the world is really unstable. You know, I talk to a lot of women and not only like globally are people feeling stressed, but people that I'm walking alongside have got some really big stuff that they are having to navigate and having to walk through really hard stuff. And so this idea that God holds us in the midst of whatever is coming at us. And like we said, you know, I think we were talking about before that Jesus says the storms of life will come, but sometimes we get surprised and it was tapping. I think we were tapping into your, I guess, your thoughts there about trying to have everything controlled and neat and tidy and all organized and how like life just has a whole different agenda and it can rip the rug from under you. And you were touching on this idea and and something that you learned in that season of your life after your second child was born about relinquishing control, like surrendering control, Mm. because all of this stuff is going to happen anyway, but our posture in the midst of it is crucial. Can you touch a little bit on that, that experience for you of that moment of surrender where you, you know, you let go of things, you held things a little lighter and the impact that has 
on you interiorly? Yeah, I mean, definitely children have this, <laughs> no matter what age, but particularly newborns. Yes. Like there is, there is this moment where you just know you've got no control over this. Like you, <laughs> you can't force them to sleep when you want them to sleep. You can't force them to eat the food that you know is going to help them get big and strong. <laughs> You know, they've got their own personalities, they've got their own agenda. And I think that's such a humbling experience. And it was such a, it was, but it was such a challenging experience for me. I think one of the things that I worked through um, in therapy was this idea that you can't, I I grow, like, I think it's quite common in in a lot of Southeast Asian families, but definitely um, for me as a Filipino, like, you know, keep the, keep the smile on your face keep um you know keep your game face on don't let anyone see that you're struggling um you know show them the beautiful house that's clean and instagram worthy and make sure that everyone believes that you're doing fine and i remember sitting in a session and i was explaining that to to my therapist and saying you know that was the household i grew up in like you know have like don't don't share too much don't um, don't let anyone in on the fact that it's that things are difficult. And I remember the therapist looking at me going, but aren't they difficult? And I'm like, yeah. They're really hard. <laughs> they are. They're really freaking hard. <laughs> like being a mom is hard. You know, being in a in a staying in a committed marriage is hard. Like, you know, sometimes the person really like you know you bump heads and like there's a lot of conflict there and you disappoint each other and you know wanting to stay stay the course is hard and all of these things that we commit to they're they're hard and so she's like who and I remember the therapist going so who helped who who does it help to pretend that everything's fine that everything's fine I'm like I don't know like and and that was the moment I realized like it is like that we don't have to pretend like all the people that Jesus met in the gospel were broken people. Were really all the people broken. that God used through the old and new Testament yeah. were really <laughs> broken people. And when we own our brokenness, we don't have to glorify our brokenness. We can just own our brokenness and come to God in our brokenness. That's when grace mm. enters. That's when his spirit can do its best work. And I, I had to really learn to just stop like I don't like I don't I don't put any value in that anymore. It's like no, let's just be real about how what it what it is and and how things are going, and let's talk openly and normalize the fact that these are strugg- that people that you know we struggle in every part of our lives and can struggle in any part of our lives, and we can help each other, mm-hmm. like you know, and being real about that. And it was a hard one to learn because I I could see the what all the reasons why you know certain cultures, certain families hold hold that sense of you know being proper and you know packaged nicely and all of that but yeah. I think definitely one thing I've really stepped into and, and I think part of it is also age <laughs> I think yeah. part of it is maturity Absolutely. and under, and yeah just owning owning our brokenness own, owning our frailties and our imperfections because that's exactly how God loves us yes it is and it doesn't serve anyone when we're or perfect, because I think there is a gift in our story and our mess. I think I posted on Instagram this morning, you know, we can, God can turn the mess into a message, the test into a testimony. And when we hide that, and and like we said before, you know, we don't want to air all our dirty laundry. We're not for Mm. that, that oversharing and overburdening, but there is a sense of just acknowledging what is and being honest about that. And then allowing people to love and walk alongside you through it. And then I think when you do that, you actually give other people permission as well I remember recall shortly after we got married we hadn't lived together and we hit heads in the first couple of months because we're both very strong people Mm. and we were at someone's house on new year's and there were all these couples you know we were probably the last couple to get married in that group and people were just sharing and one couple was sharing how they fought for the whole first year and the wife who just you would not pick this she's so perfect everything was lovely (laughs) She said she cried in the bath for the first year of her marriage. I was like, really? Mm-hmm. And she said, yeah. She said, I just was three months in and not sure what I'd done. She thought she'd mm-hmm. made the biggest mistake of her life. And I thought, wow, Jonathan and I made a promise at that point to always be honest about marriage or the yeah. struggles because who did that serve for everybody to be acting like they had the perfect they relationship? Had, yes. Because then yeah. you do have a couple who's struggling and they, they, and they think that they're, they're the only one. They think right. that, yeah, and that's, 
yeah. I think that's why I'm I'm so passionate about normalizing that kind of conversation. It's not to glorify or to air the dirty laundry. It's not right. about that at all. Yeah. It's about being real about the fact that we all have crosses. Yes. Like, th- like that was never- we grow up yeah, in like- middle age. There's a lot. <laughs> yeah. And like, and it's like that was never a part of Jesus's message, that whole idea that we're supposed to have it all figured out. And that, you know, that no one's like, this is a journey of Calvary. This he's like, you will, he, he said, you will have a cross, take up your cross. Like you have a cross. And so I hundred percent agree. There was one, I, I remember um, in one of the forums online, um, someone had asked, you know, what's the best advice that you would give to some, to a new couple who would just been married. And my heart sank. Cause one of the things that a woman had written was never speak ill about your spouse. And I know where that came from. I knew, I knew what she meant in the sense that, you know, don't, don't, you know, be their biggest champion. Yes. I think that's what yes. she was saying. But the, the fear in me when I read that is, but at the same time, we also need to be honest when we're struggling, because if we can't tell our deepest friends that's when true. things are hard or when someone's disappointed us, and if we can't see in ourselves that there's room for growth in ourselves and in the person that we're living with, like, that's that's a hard relationship to be in that's a that's a hard you can't grow from that if you pretend that everything's fine that's it and I I think you touched on Brene Brown she also says sharing with people who have earned the right to hear your story yes so it's not just I mean we have to be careful that yes I've known people who have been wounded in their past um, for whatever reason and so they share a lot and they get more hurt because they might not necessarily mm. understand, I guess, how to seek out people who can hold space around an experience and who can speak yeah. to that with wisdom and truth. So there's a balance yes. isn't there. There is, there is. And that's so that's so right. Like you do need people who have earned that right, who will hold space for it, who will give it the time and the attention and, and speak wisdom into it. Because if you air it out to everybody, then that's not healing either. No, it's not. I think you, know, you can disperse it and then you feel like you've scattered parts of your yeah, soul. That's, that's right. Oh, Joy, such a great conversation with you. I'm wondering if you can share with us as we wrap up, I guess, a scripture that's really on your heart at the moment. Cool. You know what? The one that's on my heart at the moment is actually um, it's the it's this verse from um, this year's World Youth Day because I was just lettering it last night and I thought I was praying about our conversation and it's Acts 26 16 and it's arise I have appointed you to testify to what you have seen Mm -hmm. and this whole conversation about you know owning your story understanding that God has holds you specifically you in the palm of his hand that he has formed you exactly as how he wanted you. He's allowed the things to happen in your life so that he can make glory of that, those events. Like testify to that. Like there is so much power in who we are as his children. There, we, we don't need much else. Like that's, he just, you know, we can, we can stand in our own and that just that command arise, like, you know, stand up and, and allow the world to see, testify to what you have seen in your life, what God has done in your life. Like there's, we're all unrepeatable. Like no one has experienced God in the way you have specifically, the way I have specifically, all of those experiences are unique gifts. And, and I love how you said earlier, like we're, we're on a mission you know we're actually called to to share that we're called to create things that bring those that's those stories to life that bring God into the stories of others and yeah so I, I really I'm praying on that script well I hope that conversation was a blessing to you and that you were able to glean some little gems and pearls of wisdom from Joy's story if you'd like to find her you can find her at finding joy au on Instagram or on her website www joyadanwrites.com.au and you spell Adan A-D-A-N. Ladies, if you like what you've heard on this podcast, can I invite you to leave a review on your podcast platform? This helps to share the work of the Genius Podcast. In closing today's episode, I would love to share with you the promotional video that we have for the Catholic Women's Masterclass. This promotional video really explains 
what this masterclass is and how it can really help you to bring about and establish rhythms of renewal in your life that will see you go from merely surviving your life to thriving in your life and really enjoying it. What do you do when you start spinning? When you feel that pressure in your chest because there's just too much to do? What do you do when you feel so exhausted but you don't feel there's any time to rest and you just have to keep going? What do you do when discouragement and exhaustion have become the norm and part of your everyday life? What happens when you're spinning in anxiety and overwhelm and you wake up one day and realize you are stuck in a rut and you have no idea how to get out? Working with Catholic women over the past 20 years, I have come to see up close the patterns that begin to emerge when women take on too much. When they place themselves at the bottom of the to-do list and when they live on the sidelines of their own life. I have seen the detrimental impact that this has had on their personal, spiritual, emotional and physical health. I've seen it and I've experienced myself the fruits of an overscheduled and hurried life. Over the past couple of years, I have been on a mission to walk with women as they establish rhythms of renewal that will see them living lives of balance and wholeness in Christ. It is actually possible to enjoy and manage your life instead of your life running you. So if you are struggling with overcommitment, exhaustion and resentment, if you feel disconnected from friends and community, not to mention yourself, then I would love to invite you to join us inside the Genius Project Catholic Women's Masterclass. Inside this masterclass, we will explore how you can develop four rhythms of renewal that will restore order, balance, rest and purpose to your life. In this masterclass, we will unpack what it means to rest and how the Lord wants to restore order to those wounded and unbalanced areas of your life. You will learn skills and tools that will help you actually live out these rhythms of renewal. Things like establishing healthy routines, a digital detox, cultivating a rich interior life understanding the value and the sacredness of silence and solitude and practicing sabbath this masterclass will help you overcome limiting beliefs and toxic mindsets which keep you spinning in the same patterns of negativity over and over again you will establish daily rhythms that will see you flourish as a woman in your key relationships you will discover your unique gifts and how you can actually cultivate and activate those gifts in service and contribution to those around you. And finally, you will walk in confidence, knowing who and whose you are. So join me and a sisterhood of other women as we journey over the next four months through this life-changing masterclass. Connected with you and you are interested, please visit our website www.geniusproject.co or send me an email, Karen at geniusproject.co. Until next week, ladies, have a beautiful week and God bless you.